This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Bitcoin, blockchain, ICOs, Ethereum, and all the rest. Are cryptocurrencies the 21st century unicorn, a speculative bubble, or the future of money? The Cryptocast will help you understand the rise, the fall of digital currency, the highs, the highlights, the potential, and the lows, the scams, and pitfalls. I'm your host, Jason Hartman, and we'll talk with some of the biggest names in the space. Cryptocast is your resource for all things crypto. Let's go. It is my pleasure to welcome Robert Breedlove to the show. He is the host of the What Is Money show, and he is a big expert on the topic of money and understanding what money is, what it is not. And of course, that dovetails into the cryptocurrency subject in a big way. I think you're going to find this interview to be fascinating. Robert, welcome. How are you? I'm great, Jason. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. And you are in beautiful Hawaii, right? I am. I'm on the beautiful island of Kauai. Yeah, good stuff. In paradise. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not bad here. It's a good place to be amid all the madness in the world. Yes, absolutely. You're you're kind of away from it all, so that's good. You know, I think it would be a good place to start with you to just talk a little bit about the history of money. You know, you've gone so deep on these topics and they're just really really fascinating. I think for people to understand how money developed what it really is. A lot of people don't have their head around what Mm. money really is, do they? Well, I think there's a good reason for that. You know, the namesake of the show is the What Is Money show. And I have a document, because I also do a lot of writing, that has over 50, that's five zero answers to that question. Mm. So it's not simple. Like it's not straightforward. So I actually always kind of struggle to decide which answer to go with here. But I think the first most important thing is that we have this modern misconception that money is somehow the domain or exclusive enterprise of government, that perhaps government even originated money. You know, it's somehow part and parcel to the affairs of human governance. And that's simply not the case. To look at how money emerged, when we shifted from hunters and being hunters and gatherers to becoming an agricultural society, right? We settled down in single areas and decided to cultivate the land. Um, There's some dispute over as to the reason, you know, the the common conventional wisdom is, hey, we we wanted to produce more food, um, you know, per unit of human energy expended. But it looks like we may have actually done it to get drunk, actually, that people enjoyed fermenting, (laughs) grains and whatnot. So it was to make beer and ales and things like that. So maybe it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Well, there, case, there's definitely a whole school of people, as you know, who think that agriculture was actually the beginning of the downfall of human health because it was uh, in in grains and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Yeah. So the average hunter and gatherer actually had a much, although they had a shorter, actually, I'm not sure about life expectancy, but they were much less prone to disease and they had much greater digestive health. Mm-hmm. They were much more uh, physically active. So they had a higher quality of life actually than people in the agricultural age. Um, but when we settled down to start cultivating the land and producing um, you know, more crops or more food energy per unit of human energy expended, we started creating the first economic surpluses in the world. Right, we actually had savings for the first time, and a lot of the savings was in the form of food. Um, and so, this created an interesting dilemma for humans, in that all of a sudden we had this residual economic energy, if you will, this economic surplus that was being produced. It had to be stored, but it also had to be safeguarded. Right, we had to protect this economic surplus, this food energy, from plundering from other tribes or groups that may want to attack it and steal it for themselves. This was the origin point of government. Government is the local protection enterprise for the economic network, right? In this case, it was just small agricultural enclaves, and they needed physical protection from potential predation from without. Right. So this starts to kind of bootstrap economies in a way, right? You have these different farming communities, and then, you know, 
eventually they figure out, hey, we can specialize in corn or certain fruits and vegetables. Another community that may be in a different climate or a different topography can specialize in something different. We can trade with one another and we achieve the division of labor. We get, you know, more quality yeah. and variety in our diets. And this, and it's not just food, right? It goes on into farm agricultural tools, you know, right. as governments are establishing their protection enterprises, this is weaponry, all of this, we, we discover basically the, the core principle of economics, which is we are more wealthy operating in concert than we are in isolation, right? And this is the reason we even have society. If this were not right. true, we wouldn't care to band together. There'd be sure. no, no efficiency gain. Yep. So the, the specialization of labor is what really made that difference. Exactly. 100%. And to get to the answer to the question, what is money? Once this starts happening and humans figure out, hey, trade, and this isn't like some intellectual discovery. This is just a tacit lesson of I can eat more food by cooperating with this group through trade. As these networks start to wire themselves together into trade networks, whatever becomes the most liquid asset in that community or the most tradable asset is money. That's it. It emerges naturally in any trading society. So you can think of money, like one answer for it would just be the, the epitome of trade in a way, or the most liquid good. Um, and then it just so happens we have this long history of the government seeking to commandeer and control that most liquid asset to, and there's a number of reasons here, but they would certify the validity of money, right? The, the original coinage was basically a certification function saying, I, the king, or I, the, the guy with the biggest stick, certify that this coin has one ounce of gold or whatever the content is. So instead of needing to weigh that coin at each transaction and verify and assay its value, mm -hmm. I could just trust the reputation of the authority. And this would economize trade because now we could just, oh, the coin looks good, good to go. I don't need to yep. stop, weigh it, measure it, and mm -hmm. all of these things. So that's... But then One people started clipping point. the edges of those coins. <laughs> that's right. Typically, the authorities themselves clip the edges of those yeah, coins. Well, that, that's normal, well. right? That's just yeah. like today. <laughs> that's Same inflation. Thing. That's, yeah, ancient inflation. Absolutely. Okay, so the what is money topic? Yes, 50 answers to that question, but that's a good primer. So money created the specialization of labor, or it was an out, outgrowth of the specialization of labor because barter was bulky and cumbersome and, mm -hmm. you know, didn't work very well. And so a lot of advancement came from this, mm -hmm. but then we got to kind of where we are today, fast forward a couple, you know, millennia, right? And where are we today? Of course, everybody is learning the ugly way about inflation right now. Certainly, uh, you know, I mean, I think this is probably much worse than the 70s already because it's much more manipulated nowadays than it was mm -hmm. back then. And the central bankers have all changed and learned a lot more of how to lie to everybody. <laughs> yeah, well. exactly. Uh, yeah. But where do we go from here? Like, you know, maybe where are we? Where do we go from here? And then let's talk about your ideas with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically, maybe. Yeah, so we establish that money is an emergent phenomenon, right? It's a, you know, just like markets discover prices, markets also discover useful tools. This is what we call innovation, right? People are competing in the marketplace, trying to satisfy the wants of one another, better, faster, cheaper. And from that process emerges the best tool for the job, right? But we keep discovering newer and better tools so long as we keep trading and innovating. This is just like you mentioned, the specialization of labor, the internal reflection of that is the specialization of knowledge, right? Once we figure out uh, how to produce the best tool for the job, then we, as an entrepreneur, we have an incentive to trade that into the marketplace. The marketplace becomes suffused with that information and everyone starts using that tool, right? That's why we're all on smartphones today and laptops yeah. and driving cars and flying planes. You know, these are the best tools for the job, basically. So in the sphere of money, over this 5,000 year history of humans trying different things as money, right? And we've tried a lot of different things, seashells, salt, cattle, women, like we've tried a lot of things. Gold emerged as the most functional monetary technology, like full stop. Yep. We know that. We all know gold's valuable. 
the modern day, we don't think deeply about it. We sort of consider it to be this crisis insurance for a portfolio, but it's something much more fundamental than that. The problem, and I've talked about this a lot, so I won't labor the point, but there's basically properties of money that people seek. And I narrow it to five. There's divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. So gold is the best tool for the job, the best one at satisfying those desired functions of money. However, it was limited in terms of its portability. Gold is heavy. Gold is physical. Gold is expensive to secure. It's expensive to transport. It doesn't accommodate a high velocity of money for a globalizing society. So, so one, of, one of the things you said there is interesting, and I just want to bring this point out. You know, the weight to value ratio mm -hmm. is important when considering money. Yes. And that's why so many of the ultra rich invest in art, because mm -hmm. it has a very high value density. Yes. And it's fairly portable. Now, granted, you can't put it in your pocket like an ounce of gold, but it's got, you know, maybe maybe it's worth $100 million for a painting, right? Yes. And so that's one thing people look for. And it's really interesting to think of that when you think of cryptocurrencies, because they don't have any density. Well, maybe some electrons, right? But <laughs> Well, they don't have any weight. So yeah. in theory, the value to weight ratio goes to infinity. Which yeah, is very... Actually, that's a good way to look at yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Which is a very interesting point. An excellent point, actually. Gold, that's a good way to think about it. It was the tool most capable of storing economic density across time, right? Or yeah. value density. Um, but the, again, the problem with gold is that it do, it's not fast enough, essentially. Hard to beam around the world and right. facilitate transactions in gold because of its physicality. So what do we do? We're humans, right? We use our ingenuity. We, we figure out a way to augment gold to make it scale and support a globalizing society. And we do this via the centralized custodian, right? which was a warehouse originally, became a bank, and today we call it the central bank, right? Yep. They hold the gold. They facilitate these interbank ledger entries, which are just saying, take debit column A, credit column yeah. B, and we all reconcile our transactions. But we don't settle in gold. We don't settle with finality right. very often, right? And it got to the point where by 1971, right, the world's been fighting over gold for a long time. Post-World War II, the United States rewrites the international banking order to Bretton suit Woods. its own interests. Yeah. We peg the dollar to gold. Everything else is pegged to the U.S. dollar. This gives the U.S. the infamous exorbitant privilege to just produce money, send it out into the world, receive goods and services in exchange. The system worked so long as other nations had the call option on the U.S. dollar. They could convert U.S. dollar to gold. Well, they did this for some 30 odd years. Yep. Before finally, you know, of course, we had the incentive to produce excess dollars, which we did. I think it was when Germany tried to repatriate, repatriate their gold near 1970 timeframe that Nixon um, engaged the infamous Nixon shock, closing the gold window, putting the entire world onto this global fiat currency standard. And I always encourage people at this point to check out the website, WTF happened in 1971.com. I love that website, by the way, yes. there is every chart and graph you ever wanted to see is on WTF 1971. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yes. And it's way more than a financial malaise since mm -hmm. 1970, right? This is socioeconomic, right? Addictions are up. Suicides are up. Yeah. Debt is clearly up. Divorce rates, political divisiveness. Like, so it just points to, how the corruption of money percolates through the entire sphere of humanity. And it's, it's poisonous. So we have this saying in Bitcoin, fix the money, fix the world. Right. And I think, you know, the more I've studied, the more weight I think that simple phrase carries. Robert, I want you to tie that in for our listeners and viewers a little bit, because after reading the Bitcoin standard and then having Saifedean Amos on the show, I never really thought about it the way he said it. I mean, I knew what he said wasn't new to me, the idea of time preference mm -hmm. and how that affects the culture. But he just went deeper and caused me to go deeper in my own mind about it. Is it fair to really attribute all of these societal ills or, I mean, the ills were out there before, but they've mm -hmm. increased, right? No one would deny that they've multiplied mm -hmm. 
or maybe it's just that we're counting things better now or paying attention to it more, or there's more media in the culture, obviously. How can you attribute all that stuff to the money, right? The debasement of the currency and how that accelerated massively after August 15th of 1971 with Nixon's famous speech about how he was going to temporarily suspend <laughs> the convertibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Years later, here we there's, are. There's nothing more permanent than a temporary government solution. Yeah, right? yeah. Milton Friedman. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's a univariate cause. It's not like breaking the money caused all of this, mm -hmm. all this, you know, even as it relates to time preference. Yeah. There's a multivariate analysis of time preference, right? Like you tend to be a little bit uh, higher time preference, which this gets a little counterintuitive. Lower time preference is better. Lower time preference means you have a longer time horizon. Right. You tend to have higher time preference when you're younger, right? In your 20s, you're just spending, having a good time. Yeah. Then in your 30s and 40s, you hit kind of your peak earning years. You maybe start a family. You're engaged in longer term relationships. You've, yeah. you've seen the world a bit. You've probably been in some trouble of some kind in your 20s. I don't know. You've learned, right? So yeah. your time horizon tends to expand a little bit, mm -hmm. especially if you've had kids. I think that's a big one, yeah. right? Just having kids lowers your time preference a lot because all of a sudden you're thinking about their life. You're, you're experiencing life beyond yourself in a very right. meaningful way. And then oh, okay. when you get, but, but can can you just come back to that in a minute? I want to make sure people understand what time preference is, and this is the idea. You know, it relates to time value of money and inflation, mm -hmm. and the idea that what which Saifedean points out that people are literally making decisions, maybe subconsciously, all the time because they know that the money is just losing value. Yes. So t tell us about what time preference is and then just hold that other thought, go back to that because that was interesting. Yeah. So to define time preference, it is simply the ratio at which you prefer the future to the present. Right. And it's quantified by the natural interest rate. And I want to really emphasize natural because okay. the inf interest rate we see reported by central banks is not natural. That's uh, a obviously, that's a, especially centrally now. planned economy. <laughs> yeah. The, you could think of it like this, the higher the natural interest rate, the more interested I am in receiving capital now versus later, right? right? So I have a higher time preference, effectively. I'm less likely to save when the interest rate is higher. And this, this means in particular... Well, you mean the borrowing rate or the savings rate? You mean well, the borrowing so, rate? In that but it's, here's the thing. This is where it gets complicated. We always think interest rates, like what is my bank account bearing? But this isn't even specific to money. This is capital more broadly. Mm -hmm. So the ratio at which you prefer receiving capital now versus receiving capital later. So if the interest rate is lower. If oh. the interest rate is lower, then you're going to want to borrow money and maybe spend the future, right? by yes. going into more debt. And if the That's interest right. rate is higher, you're going to want to accumulate capital because the capital's working for you. Is that a fair way to look at it? Time preference is just that rate, the rate at which you prefer the present to the future. So the more short-term oriented you are, the more likely you are to consume, the less likely you are to save, the less likely you are to be concerned about the future at all. So when money, and this is, again, just one factor influencing time preference, is when money is being debased, you can't store value in money. Right. When you can't store value in money, then you naturally are disincentivized from worrying about the future. Right? You're incentivized to spend that money, to consume. And you could argue, and this is part of the Keynesian argument, that you're incentivized to invest the problem, of course, is when money's being debased is you're literally just trying to get out of cash into anything else. So this causes a misallocation of capital, right? This distorts price signals. This induces entrepreneurial overborrowing. And there's a long you know, history on this on basically the Austrian business cycle theory, right. where these falsified price signals propagate through the economy. They mislead entrepreneurial action, where you're going to take on certain projects that appear to be profitable at the outset, but once inflation kind of percolates to the economy, you realize that it's not, and then you end up with all these busted projects, effectively. Yeah. 
And when you have systemic bust, that is a recession. There's a great book on this called Democracy, the God that Failed, written mm -hmm. by Hoppe. If you'll just read the introduction in chapter one, he brilliantly explains what time preference is and makes a really strong case that that's actually what civilization is. Like the more we can lower our collective time preference, the more civilized we are ultimately. And government action, which is really interesting too, it's a form of criminality. And I use this word purposefully because taxation, inflation, regulation, these are all impositions of willpower onto productive economic actors, right? So this is, it's a violation of property rights, basically. And Hoppe makes the point in that book that because those risks or this form of criminality cannot be hedged against, it inherently increases civilization's time preference. So government action itself, both in the sphere of fiat money, but also in the sphere of fiat law and other forms of regulation is decivilizing. It's raising our aggregate time preference, mm -hmm. you know, and as safety has popularized the concept, like this is what we need to be aiming at is lowering the collective natural interest rate and becoming more civilized. And we do this largely through an implementation of honest money or hard mm -hmm. money as he and, refers to it. And hard money or honest money lowers our time preference, right? Yes, it is an incentive that contributes to the lowering of time preference because you can save in hard money and you know it's going to be there into the future. So all of a sudden you have, right. you can think longer term because you have more economic footing yeah. longer term. You can stick your, your dollars into a coffee can, bury them in the backyard, and they're going to be worth the same or maybe more when you dig them up years later, right? That's right. So when you have a low time preference, you invest for the future you yes. do prudent things. And when you have a high time preference, it's like live for today because tomorrow we die, right? That's the Keynesian exactly. mentality, right? In the end, we're all dead, he said, or whatever yeah. it was. It's the opposite of the Keynesian idea, which is print, 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 right? So, okay, so what do we do with this? What's the action item for listeners? Well, it's funny being in Bitcoin, I think it's a very long path to get to this investment strategy. It's the one that I, I currently use, and I think a lot of Bitcoiners use. It's very simple, but the intellectual journey to get there and the distractions, especially as it relates to alternative crypto assets, and you may be operating under this misconception that Bitcoin could be disrupted by any of these 10,000 alternative crypto assets. Like I call this the Facebook MySpace fallacy. People think, oh, well, there was MySpace and it was very popular, and then Facebook disrupted it. Those right. are consumer applications. Right. This that's mm -hmm. not what money is. Money is not a consumer application. Money is a protocol, something more like a language to analogize it to the Internet, something more like HTTP or TCP IP. So humans standardize to singular protocols, typically, because there is more advantage in the network effect, frankly, yeah. whoever is using the protocol. There's more advantage for new entrants to join the largest protocol. So you get Metcalf's law working for you with the network effects, obviously, and exactly. there's more value created there. But that gets disrupted too, though, right? Um, maybe the internet as we know it today will be disrupted by, you know, a blockchain version of the internet. I'm not talking about money here. I'm just talking about there will be other technologies, obviously. It won't be well, the same in 100 years, right? Yeah. So let me the punchline with Bitcoin, and I, again, I'll just relate my investment strategy is Buying Bitcoin every single day, automatic recurring purchase, I opportunistically buy more Bitcoin on dips. It's long-term savings. My intention is to never sell. I just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to accumulate as much of this as possible. The reason I think Bitcoin stands alone uh, in the sphere of all of the crypto assets is because, again, we, we've said it's an internet protocol. Another way to look at this is the multi-sidedness of its network effects. So we, we mentioned Facebook disrupting MySpace. How do they do that? They do that by introducing a superior value proposition for one cohort of users, which are the people on social media, right? Like you're on MySpace, I'm on MySpace, we're all just users effectively of this platform. So if Facebook can introduce a superior value prop for this one cohort called users, they can disrupt MySpace. When you look at something that has, uh, say, a two-sided network effect, like Craigslist, it tends to be more insulated from disruption. Because so now buyers and sellers. Exactly. When you have a two But they're both users, right? 
They're both users, but they have different value propositions for each, right? So okay. to disrupt Craigslist, you need to introduce a superior value proposition simultaneously for buyers and sellers. Okay. So it's a bit more complicated to disrupt that type of network effect. So the, the, the lesson here is the more sightedness or the more variety of cohorts of users within a network, the more mm -hmm. difficult or resistant it is to disruption. Yep. Good point. So when, we, when we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a four-sided network effect. We've got buyers, we've got sellers, we've got miners, and then we've got basically entrepreneurs, people building on or around the Bitcoin network. So it appears to be an internet protocol. Almost I like thought you were going to say hodlers, by the way. <laughs> well, it's buyers. Maybe five. Right? <laughs> buyers are typically holders. Hodlers, yeah. Yeah. Hodlers. Um, you can think of Bitcoin as an extension of the internet itself. Internet evolved in this stack of open source protocols called the Internet Protocol Suite, which is just a set of protocols for moving information without permission. Bitcoin fits right on top of that and allows us to move economic value without permission. So it appears to be very resistant to disruption. And then when you consider just the properties of money, it's basically perfected them, right? It's taken everything that gold did historically, but combined it with the properties, the economic properties of the internet, right? So this is why we often call Bitcoin digital gold or the internet of money. And it has perfected everything that market actors seek in money, right? It's essentially infinitely divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, and scarce. The last one's really interesting. It's the first fixed supply asset we've ever had. And we know with perfect certainty the issuance schedule of Bitcoin from now until 2140. And yeah, I mean, interestingly, to your point, you know, gold is not a fixed supply, although many right. sort of view it that way. It's, it increases supply about 2% per year, yeah. which interestingly is the Fed's old inflation target rate. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, <laughs> they've yeah. uh, revised that, obviously. Yeah. 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 And it's also, you know, gold is vulnerable to technological disruption still. So yeah. you, we well, could have a breakthrough in alchemy or, you know, producing gold in a lab. The alchemy thing is, is legit, but even more legit is maybe just asteroid mining. That's right. Asteroid ocean yeah. floor mining. There is a actual threat to the scarcity of gold. Yeah. Always. We can never rectify that. But with Bitcoin, again, we've just perfected it. So there's 21 million. It doesn't matter what innovation you add to the equation. Bitcoin adapts to human action, frankly. The more efficiently we can produce hashes, the more difficult Bitcoin becomes to mine. Okay. such that it adheres to this perfectly fixed and diminishing supply curve that caps at 21 million. Let me throw out a couple skepticisms on this. And just a little backstory. I've told you this, but I want to tell the audience and I've told them before, but I, I want them to hear it here with you. So I discovered Bitcoin when it was $74, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. <laughs> None of us have uh, and, enough. And I bought a little bit at about $400. You know, my, my opinion really has changed only a little bit over the years. It went from, this is really a cool idea. I would love to see it work. I would love to be wrong about what I'm about to say, but I really am very concerned that the most powerful entities the human race has ever known, governments and central banks, with standing armies, police forces, etc., they don't like competition. And their biggest product is their currency. Like you talked about when you talked about the history of money, you know, the government had that created, you know, they got in the monopoly catbird seat of running the currency. It's just always been that way, no matter what government or what time in history, right? And so their main product is their currency. And I just don't think they are going to allow or, you know, easily allow, they may not have a choice, hopefully, and I hope, mm -hmm. I hope they lose, because I'd love nothing more than to see a decentralized currency of the people. I just don't think they're going to sit back and let something else displace their product. Mm -hmm. And I hope I'm wrong about that. I'm just afraid that'll be the way it is. You know, this particular snag, this intellectual snag is what catches most people, frankly, mm -hmm. and it is the biggest, admittedly, the biggest known unknown in Bitcoin. How far will states go to try and prevent its monetization? Yeah. I would say that the $250 trillion question is how, right? This is a very interesting thing about Bitcoin is that it is money wrapped in military grade encryption optimized for survivability. It is, it's literally purpose built to resist any attack, any attack. And it really, there's not much feature to Bitcoin. It just 
creates a new block of transactions every 10 minutes on average and sticks to the supply cap of 21 million. So there's not a lot of attack surface technologically. You know, it's the it's already been in existence for 13 years. It's performed virtually perfect on those two points, just sticking to the block time and adhering to a supply cap. It's resisted a number of attacks, actually. You know, it's been through the gamut of regulatory assault in China. It's always prevailed from that. It's come under ideological attack in the Bitcoin fork wars of 2017. It survived that. Yep. So I agree. They're going to try and do everything they can to stop it. But the real question is how? No one has answered this question well, convincingly. Well, the, you know, what I've al- the way I've always answered that question is they'll just make it illegal. And of course, it will continue to be traded and there will be a black market. Uh, you know, it, outlawing things always creates black markets. It's mm-hmm. silly. It doesn't work. It, look at drugs, prostitution, everything else. You know, it's, you know, if there's demand for something, there's going to be supply. That's the way the world works. Mm-hmm. But the amount of trading and the amount of use will decline. And I always use the example of cocaine, right? Because cocaine, at least it used to be, I don't know what it's worth today, but it used to have a very high density value, right? Low weight, high value for the weight. And it's illegal. And, you know, Mm. it's poisonous too. (laughs) But That's Mm. just a sideline. But not many people trade in that because it's illegal right? They don't want to risk their freedom Mm -hmm. and their life. Yes, some people do trade in it. You know, I'm sure drug smugglers say, hey, I'll give you these kilos for your speedboat, you know. Uh, (laughs) Right, right, right. I'm sure that happens, but it's not much. Well, there's a number of issues here because if you try to illegalize Bitcoin, there's already case precedent from, I think it's US Circuit Court, Second Circuit Court for the PGP case. This is back in the 90s. It's pretty good privacy protocol where they were trying to classify open source technology as munitions such that they could restrict the exportation of it. But the case essentially was shut once they printed PGP. It is just, it's open source code. So you printed out the whole code base on paper, Mm -hmm. presented it on the desk and said, this is PGP. How can you outlaw this? It's instantaneously protected under freedom of speech. So there's very real legal precedent and protection for open source software under, you know, the first amendment, that's really complicated. It's like, okay, you make Bitcoin illegal, then you've now contradicted the first amendment. And that's a real slippery slope. Once you can make speech illegal, you can have illegal numbers. You can have like, it doesn't make any sense at that point. I also question the enforceability of something like that. Like if you're going to take the route of illegalizing information, you're simultaneously creating incentives for other jurisdictions to be more accommodative. So if they want to support Bitcoin business, then they can absorb the whole tax base. And again, this tax base is hyper mobile. Yeah. Everybody can move to El Salvador. Sure. You know, but that well, it doesn't only have a limited be, number of people will vote with their feet, right? Doesn't have to be even with your feet necessarily, though. I mean, you sure. can establish a business in other jurisdictions without sure. ever leaving. I guess the bigger theme here is that, you know, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world. Yep. People don't understand that this includes the state. Software is eating the state. Yeah. That's why Thankfully. the state is lashing out right now, trying yeah. to reassert the validity of its borders through right. all of this excessive action, state mm-hmm. action in response sure. to this you know, pandemic, which I would classify as a a severe flu. This has been something that's been long predicted. You know, I would always encourage people to check out the book written in 1997, The Sovereign Individual. Yeah, it's a great Um, book. Software is eating the world. And that phrase rings louder and louder the deeper Mm -hmm. we get into the digital age. So I guess the the overarching Bitcoin perspective would be you ain't seen nothing yet. We think we're in the digital age now. We just got started. The inflection point was March 2020. So what was March 2020? That was the global COVID announced and the global liquidity crisis followed by the central bank response. And the other thing you have to keep in mind here is like, okay, say they make it illegal. It's totally, you know, every tyrannical thing they can do, disparaging it knocking on your door to confiscate it, whatever, whatever. It's But Robert, it'll be for our own protection. Of course, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Safety, safety, safety. If that happens, though, the solvency position of governments today is already, we're totally insolvent, right? Yeah. Just 350% global debt to GDP. It's yeah. We're toast. 
How are they going to default on that debt or cover that debt? They're going to do it via inflation. Of course. They're going to do it via fiscal, right? They're going to make our tax situation worse. There's no other way to do it. Yeah. In doing so, increasing inflation, increasing taxation, what are you doing to the productive economy? You're increasing the incentives for individual market actors to shelter themselves by any means necessary. Right. In other words, to adopt inflation, taxation, or coercion resistant money, mm-hmm. preferably. Yeah. And that is Bitcoin, right? Okay. So there's no matter what they do to try to protect their existing business model, it's like there's this hydraulic press of incentives, frankly, pushing people towards mm-hmm. Bitcoin. And, and I just and, don't think and, political and, machinations can stop and, that. And I agree with you. And we we got to wrap up here in, in a few minutes. So yeah. I want to ask you one more idea about that. Just one more skepticism. So I love the Bitcoin ideology and the technology is awesome and it's not centralized and there's no CEO they can go and arrest like right. with other cryptocurrencies. It's very different. It's in a class by itself. What about a better version of it? You know, if Bitcoin was the pioneering version of cryptocurrencies, then what about a better version? Like, you know, Bitcoin uses proof of work. What about a proof of stake coin? Maybe it won't, will also be decentralized. Maybe there'll be another Satoshi, whether he's fictional or not, that'll just put this out there into the world, hold some coins and, and let the world go run with it. That's possible, right? Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. So I would encourage people, I wrote a piece on this called The Number Zero in Bitcoin. The answer is a bit nuanced that I probably can't unpack in just a couple of minutes here, but there's a concept called path dependence. And this essentially means that the order of events historically has a certain inertia and importance to the outcome, ultimately. So Bitcoin was released at a time where nothing like it existed. Uh, Anything that was released today that attempted to be another Bitcoin would inevitably live in that shadow. It wouldn't have the same organic growth pattern. It would draw different levels of attention from from geopolitical actors. So I think Bitcoin is kind of like a unique idiosyncratic one-time event. Mm -hmm. It's emergence and monetization can't be replicated. A lot of people call this the immaculate inception of Bitcoin, um, which is important to its decentralization. And that word is again, packed full of meaning, but it essentially means it's the one asset in the world that's immune to everyone's opinion. And when you're holding a money, that's the money you want. You want the money that no one else can fuck with. Right. So there's only one. There's Bitcoin, right? Yeah. On the proof of stake point, I think it's inherently irreparably flawed. Mm -hmm. It is, you could think of for an analog analogy here is gold was proof of work money. You had to expend energy, time, resources to extract it. You couldn't counterfeit it. It required work to produce gold. Central banking is proof of stake built on top of gold right? He who has the most gold makes the rules in that system. Ergo, Bretton Woods, ergo, United States, super imperialism, US dollar hegemony, all of these things. Proof of stake is inherently centralizing and therefore fragile over time. So I think only proof of work money will succeed. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Robert, I really want to continue this conversation for like (laughs) three more hours <laughs> and get going down a lot more rabbit holes than the ones we've covered already today. But time waits for no man. <laughs> uh, that's high right. time preference society, right? <laughs> so give out your website, tell people where they can find your great work. And we'd love to have you back soon. Sure thing. Thanks for having me today. Um, you can find me on Twitter at breedlove22, B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E-2-2. You can also find the show is whatismoneypodcast.com. It's got links to everything there, the YouTube, Apple Podcasts, et cetera. And my DMs are open, so feel free to shoot me a message and let's talk money. Good stuff. Robert Breedlove, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please 
please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Oh, 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 o